my introduction today to Cecily Hammonds is going to be twofold. First, I want to do a little plug for mentoring in the Chapters Mentoring Program. Um, and I wanted to ask who in the room have been mentors? Thank you very much. And who have been, who have received that mentoring help? Okay. That's a, so we need more mentors. Okay. There is an application online and uh, the board has some priorities for the mentoring program. One is training mentors or having a workshop for mentors to help with how you coach and how you work with folks. And um, so the same for, you know, mentees. So um, if you have an interest in either side, if you would go to the website and complete the application, let us know because we are, we had several matches and we're coming to the sort of to the close of those. Typically we like to get matches that would go about six months, can be renewed, and have something less than 12 goals. Two or three is two or three is good. <laughs> something less than 12. Two or three is really good. So, um, you know, um, look at that and see what fits your needs and how you can help. And how did I meet Cecily Timmons? Um, she asked for a mentor. We'd met and we got uh, put together. And we've had two matches actually uh, in the mentoring program. And I will have to say, she might disagree, but, and I've said this to her, I probably got as much or more out of it as maybe she did. I said, what a brilliant young woman. And so uh, we are privileged to have her today to speak. Chesley's been in the fundraising and communications world for a while and has had a number of different positions. One with the National Center uh, for Women and Public Service, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Eagles and Nest, Girl Scouts in Raleigh, and um, most recently, the free clinics at Hendersonville. She has um, a lifelong learning um, initiative, I think, just like me, we believe in lifelong learning, and uh, has a bachelor's, master's, and she's working on her PhD in philanthropic communication. Uh, what? <coughs> what are you going to do with that? But today we're going to find <laughs> out <laughs> a little bit about how she's taking her experiences and applying it to the communications realm and how we can help donors with their communications and messaging. So, Miss Cecily Tennant. foundation relations, graphic and information design, um, grant writing and strategic planning. I have my master's in professional and technical communication from East Carolina and 
and I am, as Myra mentioned, working on my PhD at Clemson University right now. Um, I'm also a mom to two great girls, aged eight and two, and I uh, have recently started a consultancy, Small Shop Services, that helps the small shops, the smaller nonprofits that are often resource-strapped, budget-conscious groups, uh, really move their communications forward in a donor-centered way. Um, so part of my reason for wanting to present this information to you today um, is that I think it's crucial right now as fundraising continually seeks to legitimize itself as a theory-based profession. Um, that we take time to really explore and investigate the hows and whys of what we do. And I am in the camp like the great Kathleen Kelly who wrote what I believe is the very first um, academic fundraising text on, or theoretical fundraising text. I'm with her that fundraising can really be thought of as a subfield sub -field of public relations, of nonprofit public relations. As she says, Fundraising is the management of relationships between a charitable organization and its donor publics. And messaging is everything to public relations. Fundraising is all about relationships, and relationships are all about communication, and communication is all about messaging. So a good, authentic messaging strategy can and should guide all of your communications efforts. Current thinking is really that there are four C's around a good, um, the four C's of a good, authentic message. It must be comprehensible. You have to make sure that your audience actually understands the main point through things like tools like repetition, concision, and simplicity, connection, there has to be a value for your audience, or they're not going to pay any attention to you. Credibility. The person conveying the message must be believable and have an air of authenticity. So it's often best, for example, to have someone with more qualifications share a message to help it stick. And contagiousness. The message must be spread by your audience in order to develop clout. The more people who read it, the more people who begin to adopt your message and connect with your nonprofit. So you can really think of messaging as your guidepost for resonance. And I really like this concept of it. Messaging seeks to resonate with the reason or reasons that an individual has for acting or behaving in a certain way. So I'm going to walk you through some of the latest research in our field, specifically the peer-reviewed research within roughly the last three years, because otherwise this would have been hours long, um, that is applicable to donor messaging in my, in my particular field of interest, which is semiotics, and its applications to nonprofit communications. So as fundraisers, whether you're full-time, whether you're part-time, whether you're a CEO and it's part of your daily responsibilities or a board member or some other organizational representative, you already grasp the importance of messaging. You already grasp the power of a smiling face on a direct mail appeal, visuals and imagery, the specific words and phrases you use to capture and craft your mission, so the text and the language, your body position when you make an ask, your gestures. You do these things and make those decisions every single day, whether they're conscious or subconscious. So just a quick side note, when I did this review of the literature, the recent research, I pulled out some key trends in areas of study to present to you today, but frankly there is a lot missing here, um, and we're also limited on time. But it, to me that indicates that there are still a lot of areas that need research, and researchers because there aren't a ton, comparatively, between professions of academics studying fundraising or even really nonprofit communications at all. So uh, the few key areas is, that stuck out during this review, I'm going to focus on four of them for this presentation. The first was donor motivations. So what actually motivates a donor to make that gift? The importance and style of listening to your donors the use of positive versus negative text, tone, and image, and social pressures between donors. 
those were the four areas of research that stuck out to me in terms of uh, fundraising messaging research in the last few years. So first let's talk about what messaging even means. Messaging is a significant point or central theme, especially one that has political, social, or moral importance. So synonyms, meaning, sense, import, spirit, the gist, the moral of a story. And we won't go into this, but I, I view messaging largely through a semiotic lens. Um, the research that I'm going to summarize for you today will be presented somewhat through that semiotic lens, um, because I and many others in the, the field of communications <coughs> believe that semiotic theory is particularly useful for understanding and decoding messaging. But simply put, semiotics is just the study of signs and symbols. That's it. It's very simple. And not, not signs like <coughs> Taurus or Libra. Um, I'm Leo, not astrology, <laughs> um, but just the signs and symbols that we associate with cultural fact. So signs can be visual. Think of red octagon for stop. Um, they can be metaphoric. Think about the deep metaphors that nonprofits use in everyday com um, communication. So balance, transformation, journey. Do any of those sound familiar? Things that you evoke in your appeals. Textual. Think about the associations nowadays with using the word scientific. So nonprofit organizations themselves are powerful sources of meaning and can be considered umbrellas for a multitude of signs. Think about it. People seek meaning in everything, and therefore, when they make a donation, they are making a willing engagement with you. They are affirming that the signs under your umbrella are ones that they too hold. So as we go through these research findings, just consider, how do we employ these findings through our messaging to our donors? How do we employ signs that our donors are going to understand? So first things first, what prompts a person to donate to your organization? Anybody? It out. They can make a, they can relate to our mission or who we're serving. Maybe they can relate. So who you're serving? Your, yeah, your clientele, the public benefit. Might, their own experience. Right. Mm -hmm. The impact their gift can make on others. Yeah. Absolutely. They feel like they're actually making a difference in something. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that we could offer up that are motivations for why a donor might decide to make that gift. And recent research has sought to understand that motivation more completely and to quantify and be able to predict the likeliness of a donor to give based on those motivations. So the first thing um, that stuck out in quite a few research studies um, is this AMP model of motivation. So this guy, McLaughlin, is a fundraising pr practitioner. He's actually not a member of, um, you know, the ACAP Academy, per se. Um, he was seeking an explanatory framework for understanding what the main forces and motivations that shape the interactions between a donor um, and a fundraiser per were, particularly during the cultivation and ask process. And he found a few models of giving in the literature, but he didn't really believe that they fully explained why a person was going to give. And by the way, this is from um, 2017, as, as you can see, and I have a list of all these references if anybody's wanting to do a deep dive after this. Um, so he couldn't find anything that was truly explanatory, so he came up with his own model by doing a really extensive literature review of all the other findings that other people had found. And he proposed that all funders, or really anyone really, um, that was, is seeking to gain three things from any social or philanthropic action or interaction. Advantage, meaning, and pleasure. And these are all very personal, private benefits. So advantage refers to the fact that a philanthropic action can bestow material, symbolic, psychological, or political advantage to the giver. Meaning is the self-defined impact on a donor's moral compass, how they feel about themselves afterwards. And pleasure was fairly self-explanatory, but it's really oriented around the actual act of giving and the pleasure that you take 
in actually doing that transaction. So using this AMP model as a gauge, he found that the more these three things overlap in any interaction or series of interactions over time, the more likely a donor is to give. They all can be effective on their own, but using all three in, in conjunction predicted a donor's likelihood to give more than any alone. So our task then, if we agree with this model, is twofold. First, you have to decipher what your audience or donor's motivations, their very personal individual motivations are for giving, specifically within the framework of what advantages they might find, what meaning they'll take, and what might cost them pleasure. And then second, you need to incorporate symbols and allusions to those through your messages and your conversations with them and the materials that you provide and the things that you emphasize. So for instance, a prospective donor Cecily, who lives in Laurel Park, she might be asked to donate a brick to the local nature park down the street. The language of an ask might frame the fact that her neighbors will recognize her commitment to their neighborhood and give her a certain social clout. It might emphasize her good moral character by reaffirming her understanding of the value of conservation to preserve our land for future generations. It might evoke the pleasure she'll feel when walking her two daughters down to the nature park and seeing their names on said brick and knowing that they too will understand the importance of generosity. All that to say, there are textual and visual ways that we can make use of the information about the donor's motivations. These researchers, Conrad and Candy, also set out to document why people make uh, charitable uh, donations, but they were really looking for a little bit of the more characteristic nitty-gritty information. They started with 54 primary uh, motivations that were attuned to um, you know, private personal reasons for giving, external reasons for giving, any sort of thing that had been mentioned as a donor um, motivation to give. Their analysis supported that, we're at, that there were actually just six primary internal personal factors that motivated a donor's giving making decisions. They were trust, altruism, social and tax benefits, egoism, which is interesting because they actually found that egoism paired with altruism was the most, um, the thing that prompted people to give the most because um, these impulses sort of coexist <coughs> because they make people feel recognized, powerful, and like they can make an impact. And sort of the outlier is constraints. So that's referring to people's financial limitations, the decisions that we all make. We can't all write million dollar checks because we have certain financial you know, limitations. And fitting into the AMP model from before, it's, it actually kind of fits. We can see most of, most of these fall um, within. So social and tax are benefits that generally fall into the advantage category. What, what advantages, advantages can you gain? Well, altruism and trust fall into that moral category, and e egoism arguably is in the pleasure category. So again, constraints is sort of the outlier here as a reason more why people do not donate rather than a reason why they do. So now, knowing how important fostering trust and altruism are, should nonprofits specifically, obviously, appeal to that value in their communications and address it through their messaging? So these authors also looked at altruism. And they acknowledged that as of 2017, roughly when they started their research, uh, reports on the effectiveness of certain fundraising appeal tactic, tac uh, tactics were a little bit mixed. So they conducted a um, content analysis of charitable promotions and found that more than 55% appeal to selfless or altruistic consumer motiv motives. And I frankly was surprised it was that low. I feel like every fundraising appeal I see invokes that altruism in some way. But I mean, how many of you um, already include references to a donor's altruism or selflessness in your appeals, in your fundraising appeal letters, in your conversations? <coughs> 
Um, for instance, you might include a statement like um, in your end of your appeal letter, only through your generosity with your hard-earned dollars, 100 families without the means are able to feed their children tonight. You're appealing to somebody's sense of something outside themselves. So um, they then conducted an experiment and revealed that this kind of appeal to more selfless um, endeavors, altruistic endeavors, versus something like an organization's reputation, resulted in donors having a more favorable attitude to the, towards that organization, which makes sense. Um, however, there was a little bit of a difference. A donor's involvement or an engagement with the organization so somebody who's a board member, somebody who's volunteered with you, somebody who's come to your events and been a donor for a long time. If they have that kind of relationship, it actually moderated that effect. That effect. So an appeal to altruism and selflessness for those donors who already know your organization did not work as well. So would anybody have any idea of why that is? Maybe almost outcomes. Their own body. Yeah. Well, it almost seems generic, and so it almost seems like you've, you're taking steps back on knowing them personally. Whenever you have more of a blank statement. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And maybe it's just in an appeal because appeals are more blank. Yeah. I mean, if if somebody's already involved with you, they want to know what you're doing. They believe in your mission. They believe in your people. They believe in your symbols and signs. They just want to know what you're doing. With Right? I mean, it, it, that makes sense to me. Um, so, in short, including symbolic allusions to altruism in your promotions and your appeal letters can be really effective when targeting, perhaps, prospective donors, people that have not been affiliated with your organization before. They're going to be looking for that need to feel like they're doing some public benefit. But be wary with using that kind of language and those kinds of symbolic allusions when you're talking with a donor who's already invested in your mission. So finally on this donor uh, motivations, uh, Taylor and Miller Stevens examined the relationship between renewing donors and nonprofits. Um, they found that there was a lot of research about what prompted a donor to give um, initially, but not as much about what actually made a donor stay, about your recurring donors. And um, they found that two key things were important for, um, or essential for a donor to really be a recurring donor. Um, identity salience, and that's really just an identity. You're you sharing an identity with the organization in some way. And then this one makes sense, relationship satisfaction. Relation, but satisfaction with how the organization has actually treated you at the time. So what is the me messaging implication of this? Donors must be able to align themselves with your organization somehow. They must share symbols with you. Think about how your core values, some of those most important symbols that should be embedded in every web page, brochure, direct mail letter, how do those become theirs? How can they share them? How, did, how do you tangibly put out those signs, the wording and imagery, so that the donor, if they're like-minded to your organization, have the opportunity to identify with you? Because they're not going to be a recurring donor if they can't. Can I ask a question? You alluded a second ago, excuse me for speaking loud, but you alluded to a second ago for the importance of giving a current donor the answer to what are you doing with my gift? And yet, and I would expect that to be a third point in this slide, and I'm not sure why it's not. Um, specifically, with this study, that information was considered part of reporting out on a gift. So that was that would that was part of the relationship. So if a, okay. if they had, if the organization had held up their end of the bargain, for example, and, and in terms of those conversations, had reported out on what was actually done. Really accomplished all the things that are best practices in fundraising that you're okay, going I to. Okay, I got it, yeah. all right, good. It's on the other end of the message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm 
listening. So listening came up time and time again. How does a fundraiser actually listen to their donor? How can they show them? What models of active listening can they use? And AEL, or I don't know, have, has anybody heard of active empathetic listening? The technique, okay. So active empathetic listening is defined as a process whereby the listener receives verbal and nonverbal messages, processes them cognitively, responds to them verbally and nonverbally, and attempts to assess their underlying meaning intuitively by putting themselves in their donor's place. So that's a lot of words to just say, put yourself in your donor's shoes. And every communication that they give, whether it's shifting in their seat, whether it's shutting down when you mention certain things, whether it's hanging on to the words and the interest that they actually <coughs> say to you when you're talking to them, documenting those and actually analyzing them. Thinking through why they said that, why they shifted in their seat, why they said one thing but not another. So taking the time to actually break down those human communication symbols. Um, so these researchers, or Drollinger actually found that with major donors, the use of this listening approach provided fundraisers with the most accurate information about a donor's motivations. And that donors then on the flip side reported a deeper sense of authenticity about the communications that they were receiving in return. So again, what does that mean? It means being concerned with nonverbal signals, underlying discomforts, feelings being shown or withheld, tone of voice and body language, the subtle things that you miss if you're the one just waiting to talk. So really the point, listen to your donors. Really listen for two reasons. You'll never know who they are and how to message to them based on their values and motivation <coughs> for giving unless you've really done the work to find out. And it's not just one-to-one -one donor conversations, but market research about your audience. It's time-consuming and labor-intensive, but it's crucial for them to feel like you know who they are. And then second, show them that you've done this work. Tell them that you're listening. Use those words on your web pages, on your forms that you send back. Give people mechanisms to know that, that you are communicating and listening back to them. And then follow through with an adaption in your listening. So negative versus positive appeals. What do you think <coughs> provides more of an impact? <coughs> and by, by positive, I mean like an appeal emphasizing some good consequence of you helping, of you making a donation. Like this will happen if you just give me $10, you know. Um, and by negative, I mean, um, we're gonna lose it all if you don't give me $10. So in your experience, show of hands, what, for your, let's say, direct mail pieces, what's worked best? Negative? Positive. I guess it depends what you mean by negative in certain contexts too, because um, you hear about the studies like the one that's been discussed here about the photo that you want to use photos that aren't showing really happy after there have been served clients, but mm -hmm. people who are in need and that you can make a difference. So. Right. So it turns out that both are effective for different reasons and outcomes. Um, your positive appeals generate more favorable feelings towards your organization and towards the mission and towards the ask. Um, and even the appeal package itself. Um, well, negative appeals result in more donations from the board. Say so, that on words, the so positive you know, again then? So the positive is, is talking about what can be gained. But so, what was the outcome with positive? Um, people felt uh, more affinity for the organization, for the mission, and for the, they liked the appeal packages themselves. Um, and can't you do both, like through a testimonial where you start out and you say, when this client came to us, here's right. all the things that they were up against, and then insert organization, thanks to you and your donation, you know, and then it's happy by the end, so right. you're getting both. Absolutely. Start with the sad face, end with the happy face. Mess messaging is nuanced, but I would say that using this, types of this type of information, which do you start with? What do you emphasize? So, if your donor is one that you're trying to build a relationship with, you really just want them, at first, if you're friend raising, to 
feel good about the interaction, to feel good about your organization and the ask itself. So happy, positive feelings like that might be what you want to foster there. Whereas, okay, it, it's cut to the chase time. You've already been involved with our organization. We really need these funds. Maybe that's the time where 75% of your appeal is actually focused on this negative, that negative um, messaging. So I, I have to say I found it interesting here that um, a, a favorable attitude towards the organization and the appeal itself never resulted in more donations. So those positive feelings never actually made that leap over into making a, a, a donation. And that actually goes against um, current advertising theory right now. Um, that people engage with, buy more of when they actually like an advertisement. When an advertisement appeals to them and they think it's well done, they're more likely to actually use that product, buy that service. So that's, it's interesting how fundraising differs in that way. So, I mean, it almost feels like it depends on what medium you're using to send your message. Like I would think on a website, you might do more of the positive so that they're drawn to it, but if it's an actual direct mail appeal, the purpose of that, my understanding is that you're trying to get donations, right. and so then you, or, or I do, like this lady was saying, is starting off with the negative and the testimony, and here's a positive, but I mean, it seems like it depends on it's, it's a new what you're using dance. to try and reach the, you know, like if I'm, I, I don't, we're not setting out and spending money on appeals to build relationship. But there's other ways that we're looking to build relationships. I think that's going to come down to the fundraising strategy right. for each organization. Yeah. It's going to be very different because your donors are going to okay. be very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, how all of your different nodes of communication talk to each other and who's going where? Right. I mean, those are decisions that you have to make. Gotcha. Um, With keeping these this in mind. Yeah. text, 
bolding, it doesn't matter. Faces and photos were the most, um, get the most attention. Um, negative images by far, people lingered and were drawn to negative images over positive images by far. However, they did not study the effect of that valence. They did not study the effect on the donor about what they were gonna do with that information afterwards, whether they were going to actually make a donation. It was just where their attention was drawn. So tread lightly with that. So I think we're running a little low on time, so I will run quicker through these, but um, the final um, trend that I noticed was um, the attention to social pressures, and people wanted to explore social pressures in messaging and um, how that would affect people's propensity to give. So in this very recent study, um, the researchers reviewed 1,647 online peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and found that the more the fundraiser identified with the cause, first of all, they were, the more likely they were to adhere to best fundraising best, pre best practices. So your champions that are out there doing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for you, the more invested they are with your organization, the more they're actually gonna follow fundraising best practices. Um, and secondly, fundraisers garnered far more success in those peer-to-peer -peer efforts if they promoted themselves rather than the charity or mission. So it was almost irrelevant. That's what they found. It was almost irrelevant what the mission or the charity actually was if, it, if the method was peer to peer. It all depended on that champion, who it was, what the relationship with the other people was. The underdog effect. So um, in fundraising, it's, it's pretty common if you go to like a donation site and you're running a, a campaign that's you know time limited and really you know, stressing like donate by December 31st in order for us to get X or a match or so in the clock. We use fundraising for modern that kind of thing. Um, but new now is um, where you can um, actually, you know, pit causes one against one another. I think of <laughs> in my hometown of Hendersonville, our community co-op has little buckets outside. When you um, when you leave the co-op and you bring your own reusable bags, they give you a little chip, and you can pick one of three buckets that has a cause or a, a nonprofit associated with it. And, to, and they'll make a donation at the end of the month. And every time I look at how many chips are in each bucket, and my heart goes, oh. And it doesn't necessarily matter which one has, which one I feel the most pulled towards. Not always, but in some cases. I always give to the one that has the least <laughs> amount of chips. So do you think, um, do you think that the research supports that? That you would give to the underdog? Underdog wins. So people show a preference for the underdog if there are two or more charities to donate to. One of the charities is at a disadvantage, as in the donation amounts, tallies are, are public. A really defined goal there, that they tend to give to the organization that doesn't have as many chips in the I have a question on that, and this was a concern my director had. You know, we have an annual fundraiser each year, and you know, there's two schools of thought as what she thinks, and perhaps there is, but she thinks that some people, or she's been told that in some cases, if somebody sees like a filled auditorium mm -hmm. for your fundraiser, that everybody's thinking, oh, the other person's going to give, so I don't need to give as much. They have a home. Yeah. So it's kind of that similar concept. That's, a, yeah, that's an interesting. A, I don't know if that's slightly true. Slightly different way to think about it, but yeah, I can see You know, see do that. people really think that way? I mm -hmm. guess is my question, and I don't know if you came across anything like that in your research. I, I don't know in that specific scenario mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't know that um, there wasn't clear cut information. So they were they were reviewing situations where you could actually see how many donations were coming mm -hmm. in. So I don't know how that would shift mm -hmm. if it was more of an unknown situation. Mm -hmm. So um, norming. Past research has shown that the strategic use of social information, such as a perception about the amount of another individual's giving, so not 
total tally, but another person you know, being able to see how much they've actually given, could increase another donor's contribution by more than 10%. So if you go to um, a, a donation page, for example, and you're about to make a donation, and I'm sure some of you probably have these or have seen them, where they tell you what the average gift is. And it's more. Have you, have you, has anybody come across that? Yeah. And sometimes when it's more than you were planning to give, how do you feel about that? How do you think that changes your donation amount? Depends on how much more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the past research has shown that it, it is about 10%. Most people will be up their giving by 10%. Um, however, this, this study that they did on that finding, yes, people donated more per gift, but they felt worse about their gift. Mm -hmm. Their relationship yeah. with the organization took a negative turn. Yeah. And they felt they felt less good about the impact that they had made. All right. So now that we've re we've reviewed a few key research findings, let's just review. How does this help us with messaging? Um, do we have how are we on time? Okay, we'll do this really quickly. So just, just to review, and this is all in your slides, so you can you know, review these and mull over them and see how you feel about these. But um, you can invoke the AMP model, the symbolic and material advantage, advantages brought through donating, donating, or the consequences of a donor giving, and the pleasure of making that gift. So in, invoking a, a donor's um, advantages, the meaning that they'll derive out of that, and the, their pleasures. Um, to have a higher likelihood of securing the gift. But there are six primary motivational factors with an order of weight, I'm not gonna go through those, trust and altruism are the main primary indicators of giving. Um, however, prospective donors who are not as engaged with your organization are more likely to respond to an appeal to altruism where the same is not true for those who are already deeply engaged. Um, for a donor to be recurring, they must be able to concretely identify with your organization and the associations and symbols that you're putting out. Practice empathetic listening to, to truly understand what the donor, donor motivation values are so that you can then reiterate them in your messaging. Do the analysis about the feedback that they're giving you. All right, sorry about that. Um, Positive appeals tend to make a prospective donor have more favorable feelings towards the ask in the organization, but that does not result in more donations. Negative appeals get more donations. Those who are more engaged with you are more responsive to negative appeals that focus on the loss that's at stake, whereas those who are less engaged become more responsive to positive appeals. Negative images get more attention, but we don't know what the effect of using them is on how the donor feels. Yes, that research has been shown. And then in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, those who focus on the appeals themselves rather than the organization's admission procure more donations. The underdog wins. And um, while norming and showing what an average gift, gift is or what other people are donating may entice people to donate more, they feel more poorly about themselves as a result, as I said. So thank you, that's what I have for you today. Um, I do quarterly donor communications updates that are more expansive than these. Um, the peer-reviewed research where I do a summary of really all the findings that the experts in the field are, have put out in the last three months. Um, and I, it's just a free webinar that I do. The next one coming up is October 4th. And I also teach uh, semiotics or uh, the analysis of science for nonprofit organizations. And I have a three-part seminar coming up on November 1st, 8th, and 2nd, 22nd. It's also short. You can do them over lunch. They're always on Fridays. And there's my contact information mm -hmm. if you have any questions. So thank you very much. In our work, the question that we may ask ourselves is, 
Do I have a, do I have the time and when I'm doing development planning to do the research like Cecily's doing and know what the predictable outcomes are going to be? The real question is, <coughs> I should take the time to do all that research and when I'm we're setting goals and strategies and outcomes to know that it's research based. When we were in our first mentoring match. We were talking about development planning, and Cecily um, brought a document that had the outcomes, the metrics. Um, in her research and her experience, I guess she knew that that's where she was going to end up, and where the organization was going to end up with development planning. So while some of these messaging strategies making us think about what we've done. It's really the right thing to do, and it's right to take the time to do the research. And having been on the other side with Cecily, now I understand why she thinks this way, and I didn't in the beginning, but lifelong learners and lifelong educators are, are just that, and they do that for themselves, and they do that for our field, so uh, thank you again. So, um, I, can stay. I know she'll take some questions. If we have them. Yeah, that was a lot. Thank you for <laughs> sticking through it with me. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.